This podcast is part of the Big Heads Media Podcast Network. Go to BigHeadsMedia.com for more great podcasts. Hello, Cardinal fans. Welcome to episode 18 of the St. Louis Cardinals Unrestricted Podcast. This is your host, Christian May Suzuki, and I gotta say, the Cardinals sure proved me wrong, right? They certainly made me eat my words because I really did think that this season was over after that debacle. But a week later and here we are. The Cardinals are about to enter a series with the Padres with the second wildcard spot in hand. And they really have a chance to really cement that, this series. And it seems like it's a crazy thing to be talking about considering the position that the team was in and the way that the body language looked, the fact that the team was giving up a 5-1 lead in the ninth inning, it it's a pretty remarkable, remarkable story. I think somebody said it best is that we fit a whole season's worth of signature moments into essentially a week. And that is remarkable. It, it's been remarkable. And there's, there's really no way to explain it besides what outside fans like to call cardinal devil magic the the way that this team has suddenly come together and the way that little things just seem to work out a ball is hit really hard but right into paul goldschmidt's glove or really hard and right into tommy edmund's glove or just missing a home run or just missing a fair ball all these little things have happened over the past week, and they, they seem to have added up into what's happening now with the Cardinals suddenly in control of their own destinies and in the second wildcard spot. Obviously, it doesn't just fall on them. They've also had a lot of mishaps from other teams like the af- aforementioned Padres and teams like the Reds as well. It's It's been a hell of a story considering that the Reds were really in position to even win Nick Castellanos potentially an MVP and it might sound crazy but that was the position that the Reds seemed to be in heading towards the playoffs with a guy that was really leading them in a lot of categories and was doing very well for them you had an argument at that point that Castellanos had a shot at MVP that's not going to happen anymore with the way that Cincinnati has sort of fallen out and hasn't really cemented itself as that second wild card spot and that's opened the door for the Cardinals to really come through and now they have a three game matchup with San Diego and it's one that they should be favored in they should have a lot of success in and as much as the teams are paralleled offensively I think there's a lot of posts been made where just talking about how many hits they've had are about the same, the extra bases are about the same, the average is about the same, and it's rather uncanny, in fact. Coming into September 14th, both teams were 74 and 69. Both teams were hitting 240. The Cardinals were slugging 399 and the Padres 398. The Padres 1,134 hits and the Cardinals 1,133 hits. And the Padres 161 home runs to the Cardinals 162. It was pretty remarkable. And yet, when you look at the pitching, which might be the matchup here, you see a completely different story. You see three guys from the Padres, Velasquez, Darvish, and Arietta, who remarkably all have seen significant drop-offs in their production since a particular date. And that particular date was the date that a particular memo released. And I think we all know what we're talking about here. So let's let's get into the nitty-gritty. Before the memo was released on June 15th, Vince Velasquez had a 4-2-5 ERA, which is not great but solid. Arietta had a 5.14 ERA, which again, not very good. And you Darvish was in the Cy Young conversation with a 2.28 ERA and allowing a slash line of 189, 256, 329, which is Cy Young level. It is it is elite material. 
and then you go to after the memo released on June 15th, and Vince Velasquez since then has an 8.45 ERA. You Darvish has a 6.59 ERA, and Jake Arrieta, the last starter, is all the way up to a 10.44 ERA since June 15th. That is stunning. The stark contrast there, it, it, what else is there to say? Now, when you look on the Cardinals end, you have maybe a di- not a different story, but there is most certainly different looking numbers. Now, when you look at the first one in Miles Michaelis, you can say, okay, he had a 604 ERA in his five starts after the memo, which is five of his six starts this year. And then a 3.65 ERA in the 15 starts he had before that, dating back to mid-July of 2019. Okay, yes, there's a huge difference there. But there are plenty of other factors that go into that, namely the all the injuries that Michaelis has been dealing with and the fact that he just hasn't been able to get into pitching at all. And there might be some context with Velazquez and Arietta that I'm missing, but Darvish is, is clear as day. The sticky stuff really hurt him as much as it hurt any other pitcher outside of maybe Oraldis Chapman. And Adam Wainwright, in fact, he had a 3.95 ERA before and actually improved dramatically, as Cardinal fans know, since then. After June 15th, he had a 2.11 ERA, which obviously is stellar and is leading towards what might be a top five Cy Young finish. I don't think that he's going to end up in top three. I think that there are guys like Scherzer, like Bueller, like Wheeler, and like Burns that all probably have better cases, unfortunately, than Wainwright. But I think besides those four, he can definitely slide in, especially given that there's a lot of bias it seems towards these older seasons you know you saw it with the way that people perceive in football tom brady the way he played swell simply because you know you all heard it before he's 41 he's 41 and that that's all well and good for a legacy talk but when it comes to award voting it should be straight It shouldn't have to do with age or stage in their career. It should just be who the best pitcher was. And Wainwright is probably the fifth best pitcher in the National League this year. And that, you know, as as crazy as it sounds at 40, that is the fact, I believe. And he's demonstrated that with a lot of innings pitched, with a sub-3 ERA. And he has put a lot of wins on a team that, doesn't really have a lot of wins you know on 16 wins on a 76 win team is pretty impressive he has a chance to hit 20 wins and everyone is freaking out about Urias potentially hitting 20 wins so I think that it's very telling that Wainwright has been able to do this as the number one guy without Flaherty and maintain the success that he has especially after the whole sticky ball situation happened it really goes to show that despite all the controversy with him admitting that he used it at some point and then gave it up he he doesn't need it obviously gay hap the third pitcher in the rotation here is it's not necessarily enough of a contrast to really think that any outside factors have anything to do with it when you look at his era before it was 575, which was part of the reason why it was such an issue that Cardinals were trading for him. And after the memo, it went up just to 617. There's really not much of a difference to call it anything but standard deviation, just simply playing worse than he was, a little bit worse than he was before. But there's no obvious, huge, dramatic change that would suggest that success was predicated on the sticky stuff. And I think that that will be really interesting to see over the next couple of games. Because if the Cardinals are looking at it from 
the numbers perspective, and if you look at it from that particular perspective, you're going up against a team who is offensively about even with you and pitching-wise has essentially cratered since the sticky stuff happened. So you're essentially going against three almost triple-A pitchers at this point. That's what they're playing like. You don't see a lot of guys with a 8-4-5 ERA as a starter in the major leagues. You don't see a lot of guys with a 10-4-4 ERA starting in the major leagues. With Darvish, you don't see a lot of guys with a 6-5-9 ERA starting in the major leagues. And that's what all these guys have been since the sticky stuff was banned. And that's what the Cardinals really have to take advantage of. This is a time where not only do you start scoring because you're going up against bad pitching and you want to take advantage of it in this matchup, you also want to get into a good rhythm, try and get into that idea of being able to hit against a team that you're competing against in the playoffs in a very crucial situation. You want to get used to being able to be successful in those tough situations so that you can repeat that when it really does get tough, when it really matters in the deepest part of the playoffs. I've, I've always been an emphasis on this, is that a lot of times, a lot of these teams, a lot of players, they need a little bit of a taste. They need to understand how to win before they actually do it. Going back to football, an example of this, I think, is was Jared Goff. Jared Goff was very much highly touted and someone who was considered an elite quarterback prospect, but he had never learned to win. He was a team guy on a team who lost to... I, I knew people who beat Jared Goff in high school. And then he went to Cal and didn't particularly win very much there as well. He was the worst winning percentage of any first round or number one quarterback ever and look where he at he still doesn't really know how to win and when the going got tough and and things really got down to it in the playoffs and in the Super Bowl he crumbled because he didn't have the experience he didn't know how to win and even if the Cardinals don't necessarily make it too far it is that learning how to win and learning how to win together as a team in a situation where you're going up against a team that is about as good, if not better than you, or more talented, in a situation where you essentially have to win, it's a do or die, those are the moments that you're going to be facing in the playoffs. And those are the kind of games that they simply have to learn how to win. It's not necessarily out of the realm of reason with some of the veterans on the team to say that they perhaps know Obviously, we have Yadier Molina, who clearly knows how to win. We have Adam Wainwright, who knows how to win. But even guys like Paul Goldschmidt and Nolan Arenado, these experienced players haven't had that truly deep playoff run where it really did come down to it in that respect, where the pressure is on in the playoffs and you need to come through or... Your team needs to come through, and it may and that those players may it happen. That's that's not something that Goldschmidt or Arenado have experienced yet or have proven yet. And they're great players; they're proven players. But the postseason and October baseball is a whole different game. And there's obviously a chance they could come in and perform well. They prove that they don't really need seasoning; that they just go in without a hitch and do what they do that is 100 percent a possibility but we don't want to save finding that out for the moment where we actually get eliminated if we lose so it's always nice to be able to do it in a season where you might not have that similar expectation and where you are really still just learning how to win and learning how to play together and in Nolan Arenado's case learning how to play at Bush Stadium so brings me to this if the Cardinals make the playoffs and say get 
absolutely roasted by the Dodgers, which is not necessarily, obviously it's not going to, or we don't know if it's going to happen, but probability's sake, it's, it's most likely going to happen with the way that the Dodgers are constructed and Max Scherzer in a playoff game. As good as Wainwright is, Max Scherzer in a one-game playoff is not going to be easy. And if I had to bet between whether the Cardinals would break through Max Scherzer before the Dodgers would break through Adam Wainwright, I would kiss that table goodbye because there is no way I would put any money on that. The Dodgers offense is just too potent. And the Cardinals offense has shown otherwise in many cases. They have their moments and they have their Cardinal devil magic for sure. But it's hard to say that the Cardinals will beat the Dodgers more times than the Dodgers would beat the Cardinals in this similar situation. And we just got to hope that we get one of those times where the Cardinals end up winning because we've seen that before and hopefully that ends up happening. But to say that the Dodgers do end up winning, is this season a success? I think is is a question that's been thrown around a little bit. And I think it's all relative. I think that your idea of success really depends on the position that you're in, depends on your view of the team, of the franchise, and just of what success is dictated as as a whole. Do you think that success is moving forward? Or do you think success is winning at all? Do you think success is putting down the building blocks? Or do you think success is those building blocks actually cashing in and really paying off in the end? I would say that for most cases, what I would define as success is the latter. I think what we would call this is a a good thing, a positive step forward. And yeah, it's probably a, a positive season. Would I call it a successful season? I think by the terms of the expectations, sure. I think we definitely defied expectations and had a good season in that regard. But could they have been better? Could they have done more? Is this really the success that we want to see? I, My sort of view is that true success and the ultimate goal at the end of the day is winning the World Series. And while seasons like this are excellent, they're important, and they're positive steps, it's, it's just like Kobe said, job's not finished. Success implies that something is over, it's finished. Losing in the wild card doesn't mean your job is finished. It just means you got to revamp and continue to progress, take that next step, get better, climb, continue to climb that rope. And that's what I see this Cardinal season as. This is the Cardinals climbing up that rope, and they cl- are climbing a lot faster this year than than was expected. They they got up a lot farther to the to the top of the mountain than most people expected, myself included, and that is a good thing. But at the end of the day, success success will be when the Cardinals really make a deep run with this core. That's what will be a successful season. And whether they lose in the World Series or win in the World Series, this team is built to go for the gold. That's why the goldschmidt Arenado trades happen. And to win those trades or to get those kinds of players while giving up prospects without actually giving up real solid MLB talent, you are sending the message that we are trying to win now. And 
until that actually does happen, I'm going to hold off on calling this season a success. I'll call it a positive step, and I'll call it a season in which they performed far better than expectations. And it was a good season, a positive season. But the word success is one I'm not going to use. A successful season is a season when, in where you win. And at the end of the day, professional baseball player, their job is to win. And that's, that's when you're truly successful. So we need to continue to keep our eyes forward. And while we can celebrate the season for what it is and for the positives that it is and for the fact that it really did open up that championship window a little bit wider now that we've seen that we have players that are ready for it and that haven't necessarily shown that they can produce in the playoffs but have shown that they can produce enough and that they can play well enough and that they are at the level where we can get there and honestly if they play similar to this for their whole season they're pretty well cemented in the playoff standings and not necessarily climbing and trying to scratch for a wild card spot after having like a 2% chance at the beginning of the month or beginning of last month so where does that all bring us that all brings us to this this season is a good season it is a great season it is a season that has defied all expectations and a season where in many cases the team despite all of its injuries has performed far better than the sum of its parts would tell you it would and that itself is positive but in order to move forward we need to keep our eyes on the prize and tell ourselves that this is a good step but this is not a success because we we still have to keep moving forward and win a World Series with this core. And I honestly have legitimate faith that they can. I really do think that this outfield and the corners that we have are really capable of anchoring an offense and anchoring a defense with the legitimate pitching staff. And we can really put something together. They just need to finish off that pitching staff. They need to get Jack Flaherty back. They need to get Jordan Hicks back. They need to settle the bullpen down. And once that all happens, I think things will really start coming together. I think that this team, as it is, might have some difficulties. But add a few more pieces, add another pitcher, add perhaps a shortstop and suddenly you are really there and this team that Mo has constructed is actually one where you don't necessarily complain about a lot of the trades that he's made because there really isn't going to be a lot of spots if you can just fill that final piece you can obviously complain about letting Colton Wong go and that is unfortunate but Tommy Edmond has been just not just as serviceable perhaps but he's played more games and he has been at a similar level to Wong so you have a point where these guys wouldn't fit anymore even guy like a Rosarena yes perhaps better than Dylan Carlson perhaps but are we really splitting hairs over that at this point We have Dylan Carlson, we have Tyler O'Neill, we have Harrison Bader. These are all guys who we know can be our future outfield. So at the end of the day, Rosa Reina, Adolis Garcia, who knows if those, at the end of the day, in an ideal world, maybe they're over Carlson. But if that happens, then Carlson goes to another team and we might be having this conversation again. You just never know. It's the hypotheticals there are just too hard to say when you have a team that you can be happy with when when you have a position like shortstop and you have Paul DeYoung then you can complain a little bit more but right now 
as it stands from first base to third base to the outfield to the catcher's position position players it's it's hard to say that this team isn't almost ready or at least has a shell of a core to really make a legitimate world series run and these guys are a lot of them are young too we have a window with arenado and goldschmidt obviously but the other three guys are still developing they're still ready to get better so this team can only continue to go up and it will suck losing wainwright and they certainly need to find a second guy to pair alongside flaherty when wainwright goes but i'm saying the pieces are there and it's not just like Moseliak is necessarily as much as i dislike a lot of his moves it's not like we can necessarily say that he's just throwing rocks into the water like he did with J.A. Happ and John Lester. He he has really put together a team. Maybe not a good pitching staff. and Maybe that's where the problem really lies. But the position players are there. And I think that this series will really show the mindset of this team. And if they can really capitalize and jump on a Padres team that has been struggling defensively or on the pitching end since the sticky stuff and who are coming off a pretty uplifting win against the Giants. This will really show us where this team is and how far this team needs to go, not from necessarily a talent perspective, but from the mental perspective, because it might not necessarily be apparent yet, but my belief is that there is enough talent here offensively and as fielders just outside of the pitching there is enough talent from the position player perspective for this team to compete for a world series especially if another shortstop is acquired and i think as we roll into the off season a little bit we will talk more about shortstops but I do feel that with all the rumors that come out and all of the focus that the Cardinals seem to have on shortstop, my feeling is is that as great as Sosa is and as, as nice as he is, I think that the attendance ratings and the window that we have with Goldschmidt is apparent now to the DeWitts and to Moseliak, and I think they will start making moves or make make that one last move that will many people will say takes them over the top and makes them contenders and i think they might need perhaps another pitcher but getting that last shortstop or getting that last position player in before yadi leaves for potential legitimate run that is that is a uh, a thought that with all the potential shortstops that might be out there, you know, Corey Seager and Trevor Story, I think, are the two that have been highlighted in particular. I think that you you have to go and get it. You have to go and make that jump if you can and simply see what happens. Because as, as great as Sosa can be and as, as much as it's nice to have have him play and develop him the window is predicated on Goldschmidt and Arenado and if you can give yourself as many opportunities to compete as you can inside of that window that is what you need to do and hopefully it happens you never know but hopefully the Cardinals are able to get a shortstop in the offseason and turn themselves into a legit top tier offensive team and then maybe another pitcher develops into a, a number two that the miles michaelis probably should have been and we have a pitching staff that can at least survive in a playoff series and that's all that the cardinals need because when it comes to baseball it anything can happen and Cardinal fans have seen that time and time again. And if we need to call on that Cardinal Devil Magic, then so be it, I guess. So be it.
thank you all so much for listening. I hope that you all are enjoying this wild, rocky ride of a season. We will hopefully be on halftime app soon. I'm still trying to get that sorted out where before and after games, we will be able to chat and you can come and ask questions and we can discuss different numbers and things and have a good time watching the Cardinals. Thank you all so much and be sure to follow us on Twitter at STL Unrestricted and go Cardinals.